Good afternoon. Uh, we are very pleased to have today distinguished professor Richard Alba to give the conference, The Great Demographic Illusion, How Simulation Matters in 21st Century America. Thank you, Professor Alba, for being here with uh, Ibero Puebla and also with Seattle University. Uh, we thank Guillermo Irizar for inviting you, and we also thank Professor Audrey Hutchins for being with us and co-organizing this event with our students and faculty members. I'm Elena Yala Gali, and I'm pleased uh, to have you all here. And so now, um, Audrey Hutchins will introduce our distinguished guest. Ow! Ow! I just, I just, I just hit my knee against the. Oh, yes. Um, wow. Okay, so I'm taking my mask down because I'm not looking at them. But these are my my students. Yay! And. Um, Yay to Richard and Guillermo and Elena. We're so excited to be with you today to learn from you uh, and engage in this great conversation. So Rich, Dr. Richard Alba is Distinguished Professor of Sociology at the Graduate Center at the City University of New York or CUNY. Uh, he was educated at Columbia University and arrived at CUNY in 2008 after three decades at State University of New York in Albany. He is, he is known for developing assimilation theory, which will be very important in this uh, conversation and also in the class that we are doing together with Guillermo. Um, and assimilation theory is, is oriented on the idea of fitting the contemporary multiracial area, uh, area of immigration with studies, and, and he studied in America, France, and Germany. That's been the focus. And so his many books include The Great Demographic Illusion, Strangers No More, Blurring the Color Line, and Remaking the American Mainstream. So excited to be with you today. Thank you so much for being with us. Oh, great. Oh, well, thank you very much. OK, so I should bring up my PowerPoint. Let's hope I can. No, yeah, there it is. Um, hey, um, I hope everybody can see it. Confirmation, yes, please. Yes. OK, yes. Um, I apologize. It looks like I didn't change the subtitle, but it is about how assimilation matters in 21st century um, America. So um, I think the way I think of this talk is it's really about what is the best way to think about the impact of large scale immigration um, and rising diversity in the US, but also in other wealthy Western societies that have received um, many immigrants since the middle midpoint of the last century. Um, in the US, the widely accepted narrative about how immigration is changing American society can be summarized with the phrase the majority minority society. And that refers to a society which is presumed to come into existence in two decades where the former population majority and dominant group whites are going to be outnumbered by minorities or people of color or other uh, phrases to cover people who may have non white skin and come from the global south. Um, and I think it's interesting here to see that other immigration societies have a similar um, narrative. For example, in Europe, something called replacement theory is rather popular, especially on the right. Um, and replacement theory holds that elites are um, favor immigration from the global south in order to replace um, the native majority workers with workers from, from other countries. Um, and incidentally, in, in the French election, there's a presidential election that will take place next month in France. And replacement theory is a hot topic um, in this election. And in particular, one of the right wing candidates named Eric Zemmour um, has been invoking it as, you know, a realistic fear um, for France. So in the US, um, to come back to the US, um, the story of the majority minority society 
seems to be supported by um, the country's census data. And I'm going to say that um, part of what's interesting here is that the census data um, supporting this story have some major flaws. And in particular, they obscure a major degree of assimilation um, and of mixing within families across um, the ethno-racial divide. OK, so uh, so as I, I guess I've given away the next paragraph. So a big part of my story is that increasingly families are forming that bring together uh, people from the uh, the majority group, namely white Americans and people from minority groups. And so there is a surge of then of young Americans who are growing up in families where one parent is white and the other parent is minority. And I think the the status of um, these mixed Americans give us a lot of insight into some of the changes that are taking place um, in the US. And interesting here is the centrality of Latinos um, to this mixing that's occurring in the United States. Um, so this 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 pattern that's emerging of mixing in families and young people coming from mixed backgrounds really encourages us to rethink how we understand assimilation. <clears throat> and and I will, as the talk proceeds, I'll be <clears throat> invoking, <clears throat> excuse me, assimilation history to try to make sense of uh, some of the patterns that we see. OK, so. Let's think of majority minority America as a as a narrative <clears throat> and by narrative, I mean a a, a simplified storyline that is wants to tell us how the society is changing and what those changes will mean um, in the future. Um, so part of the majority minority America narrative is the notion that demography is destiny. So um, the argument for a majority minority America is really founded on um, demographic data and um, and in the in the in the uh, principle. United States, like differences between older and younger um, Americans. And so the majority minority America sees the society as divided into two parts, a white part, which is losing numbers, relatively speaking, and a non-white part, which is gaining numbers and will eventually become the numerical uh, ma majority of the population. And this image of the binary binary division of society accords with a, another important storyline, which is the storyline of race in America. Um, and so the story and race race theories are very, very consequential now in the United States, both in social science and outside of social science. And they tend to see, again, a society divided in two. There is a dominant white population which has enjoyed power uh, for centuries and uh, and has many advantages over non-whites. Um, and there is obviously a non-white population that in many ways is um, subject to the dominance of whites. So presumably the end of whites majority status makes their position more vulnerable. And that's one reason I think for the popularity of the majority minority narrative. In any event, if whites do lose their majority status, presumably they're going to be important societal consequences. Now, um, there's the majority minority narrative also has a very important political role um, in the United States, and it's been deployed particularly by conservatives to stir up whites um, and to encourage them to vote 
uh, for conservatives. Trump, in his discussions of immigration, um, clearly was invoking the majority minority story and some of its kind of um, sub subtext. Um, and we have, in fact, strong evidence in the social sciences developed by social psychologists that many American whites react negatively to the majority minority narrative. Um, that is when they are prompted to think about it, they um, espouse more conservative political attitudes. They, um, they enunciate uh, more stereotypical views of, of minorities. Um, and it does appear that um, this narrative has had a political effect in the sense that the political scientists analyzing the 2016 election, the election when Trump was elected president, point to White's racial resentment as a major factor um, in the outcome. And presumably, the majority minority narrative is feeding this racial resentment, making whites feel angry about the growing power of non-whites in American society. OK, so how does census data play a role here? And I think uh, it's important to understand something about data. Um, data are not a, a, just a transcription of reality. We shouldn't think of data in that way. Data are always constructed by social scientists, by others. Um, so they're really a screen through which we try to glimpse social reality. Sometimes that screen is close to transparent, meaning that we really see social reality very directly. But at other times, um, the screen is is more opaque and harder. It's harder to understand the precise relationship between the data and the social reality that we want to understand. And I'm going to say that's really the case with the census data today about race and ethnicity in American society. <laughs> So um, the Census Bureau um, classifies individuals by uh, their race and ethnicity. That's part of, you know, that's uh, been part of census history since the very first American census in, in 1790. And it's actually built into the constitutional provision that requires that a census be taken um, every 10 years. Um, the problem is that uh, the way the categories are constructed is not always very faithful to um, the actual backgrounds of the individuals who are filling out the census form. And on top of that, the Census Bureau also projects the population. Now, a projection um, basically uses contemporary or present day demographic patterns to try to look into the future and to say, well, if these patterns hold, this is what the future will look like. Um, so the census projections, the most recent ones, for example, uh, see a majority minority society occurring within about two decades. By uh, 2045, um, non-whites are projected to be the numerical majority of the American population. But look at how, uh, in the second paragraph here, look at how it defines um, who is a white. So it says this majority minority society will occur then when half, more than half of all Americans belong to a minority group. And a minority group is anything other than non-Hispanic white alone. Now, this is census speak. It doesn't necessarily mean very much to ordinary readers. But it has a very precise definition, which many readers would not understand. It means, in particular, that anyone who has a racially mixed background, excuse me, <coughs> um, is going to be classified as non-white. That's a problem, and um, and which we'll soon find out how important that problem is. And it's also true that the census 
cannot even detect all mixed backgrounds. And because of the way the census is legally required to classify individuals, those who are partly Hispanic and partly non-Hispanic um, cannot be recognized and in general will be classified as Hispanic only. Okay, now, and this way of this, this census data, which has this trouble with people of mixed background, this becomes a problem because of the steadily rising mixing that is occurring in families. So in the United States, historically, it was in many places against the law for people from different racial groups to marry. And in particular, um, marriage between whites and many non-white groups was forbidden um, by law. So finally, in 1967, the U.S. Supreme Court threw out the last of the so-called anti-miscegenation laws, meaning that now people were free throughout the United States to marry someone from a different racial group. Incidentally, the case uh, that led to this change in the law had a wonderful name. It was called Loving v. Virginia. And the family involved was the Loving family. And it was a, it was a white man and a black woman suing the state of Virginia to be allowed to marry. And they won their case. So in 1967, the intermarriage rate, the racial intermarriage rate was still very low. It was about 3%, but it's been rising steadily. And now, according to the latest calculations of the Pew Research Center, about 20% or one out of five of new marriages involve partners from different major ethno-racial categories. So that could be a black person marrying an, an Asian person or a white person marrying a Hispanic person. The great majority of these couples, however, have at least have a white partner. So it's mainly then whites marrying minorities that uh, that produces this rise of, of intermarriage. Well, needless to say, if there's a lot of intermarriage, there are going to be a lot of mixed children. <clears throat> and in fact, some mixed children, of course, come out of couples that are not married, but still may regard themselves for a period of a time uh, as, as a family. So here I'm showing birth certificate data. Now, birth certificates are the, are the most universal way, really, of recognizing mixing in children because they include children who are not um, the children of a married couple, but could be the children of an unmarried couple. And in all states, birth certificates re register the ethno-racial background of both parents. So in 2017, um, mixed infants, that is to say infants with parents from two different groups were about 14% of all births. That's one out of every seven. Um, and the great majority of these mixed children had a white parent. About three quarters of them had a white parent and uh, and a non-white, or at least not not exclusively white parent. But look at the biggest group. It's a group that's almost unspoken about. Namely, a one parent is non-Hispanic and white, and the other parent is Hispanic. That's forty percent of all of the mixed births, and it's one out of every two of the mixed births involving a white parent. <laughs> so children who where one whose one parent is black and one parent is white are 14 percent of all the mixed births. Um, children of Asian and white parents are 10 percent. Um, and, you know, the others are, are um, uh, the other groups are even smaller. Um, the only minority combination that's large in number is where one parent is Hispanic and the other parent is African American and that those children represent 8% of, of all births. Now, the number of mixed children among all births has been ratcheting upward over time. 
So this this uh, in 2017, 11% um, of um, of of all births were to a white parent and a minority parent. If we went back to 2000, that number would be much smaller, and it continues to ratchet upwards. So what that means then is that mixing mixed backgrounds are really concentrated among young Americans and among older Americans. People from mixed family backgrounds are uh, smaller in number. Well, OK, so this raises the question of how we should think about people who come now from uh, racially mixed family backgrounds. Certainly, there's been mixing throughout American history without question. And even in the period of slavery, there was a great deal of of sexual mixing by white men taking advantage of non-white women, and that gave rise to many mixed children. But that mixing wasn't recognized in terms of um, th those, those children were brought up exclusively by the minority parent and not by both parents. <laughs> and indeed, even in the 20th century, um, the idea of the one drop rule that um, a, a person who was mixed white and minority was really minority um, was was a social reality. But that's no longer true today. And indeed, from a sociological perspective, I think the crucial feature of, of the new mixing is that um, these children are being brought up in mixed families where um, one parent then um, represents the whites and, you know, and there are many white relatives and the other parent represents a minority group and there are many minority relatives. So these young people then are sociologically in a very different um, situation, not only from the mixed children of the past, but also from most white children on the one hand and most minority children on on um, the other. And so one of the things that's very interesting about mixed individuals is that we um, we know from from looking at census data and matching the same individuals across different census data sets that individuals from mixed origins have um, unusually fluid identities. They're not consistent in the way they uh, report themselves on the census and sometimes they appear as members of single categories, and at other times they appear as mixed. And um, unmixed Americans are much more consistent in, in the way they report themselves. <laughs> okay, so now a little interlude. So I, it was I promised early on that I would talk about assimilation a little bit, and I'm gonna talk about it a little bit. And I wanna just try to um, diffuse or, or, or alter a concept that you may have of what assimilation means. So a kind of, um, you know, common notion about assimilation is that assimilation obliterates the, um, the, the ethno-racial background of a minority person, that in assimilating, that person takes on all the characteristics of uh, the group into which he or she is assimilating, mostly the white group, and loses kind of all of the um, characteristics that that they were raised with in in their family, and that's not the way I think assimilation has worked historically, and I certainly don't think it's the way assimilation works today. So, um, in one of the books um, uh, that was mentioned, re uh, remaking the American mainstream. Victor Nee and I try to update assimilation to kind of refashion the idea of assimilation so that it worked better in uh, multiracial America of the 21st century. And so we defined assimilation as the decline of an ethno-racial distinction or boundary. And so decline here doesn't mean disappearance. It simply means that um, that ethno-racial background is less important in determining 
a person's life, like determining the social position that he or she occupies or determining um, the relationships that he or she has with with other people. Um, so it doesn't require then that um, a person lose all of the ethno-racial background that they started with in order to become a member of a new group. And so instead of thinking of assimilation as moving from one group into another, that's the older concept of assimilation, made very famous, by the way, in a, 19, a book in the, from the 1960s called Assimilation in American Life by Milton Gordon, which was really the Bible of assimilation theory for the remainder of the 20th century. But instead of thinking of it that way, we argue that we could think of it as um, entering into the mainstream of society, where by the definition of the mainstream, um, the role of ethno-racial origins in determining status and shaping interactions is diminished. You can think of a person who is assimilating as decategorized in some sense. He or she isn't seen all the time in terms of um, his ethno-racial background. So I will argue much later that uh, what assimilation did in the middle of the 20th century, when many <coughs> white ethnics assimilated, is that it expanded the mainstream and made it more diverse. And that's also a good way of understanding what assimilation is doing in the 21st century. It's expanding the mainstream and making it more diverse. But now the people who are assimilating are people who come from mainly from new immigrant origins having to do with originating in Asia, Latin America, the Caribbean and so forth. OK, so. Um, now I'm going to take the mixed group as a way of looking at this kind of um, assimilation. And this just says uh, this slide just says that we have now a fair amount of evidence about mixed Americans that we can put together, almost like we put together a jigsaw puzzle, and we can see emerging from the pieces that we fit together, a picture of kind of where these mixed minority white Americans are located um, in American society. And basically the argument is that they really look like they're becoming part of the mainstream with a possible exception, and that is the exception of people who come from black white backgrounds, because we can see also in the research that they face much more um, racism than um, others do. So um, let me talk a little bit about what the evidence tells us. So and here the key, I think, is what I'm calling Gordon's idea of structural assimilation. And it's not so much how people identify themselves, because we've already said that's very fluid. It's really where do they fit in Amer in the social environments of American society? You know, who do they associate with? Who are their who are their close friends? Who do they work with? <clears throat> where do they live? So what social milieus are they um, embedded in? And of course, you know, whites are dominant still in American society. So that means that the mainstream of American society is dominated by whites. So hence, contacts with whites, especially contacts in close relationships, are really important uh, evidence of a mainstream participation or, or assimilation. And it's on that basis, really, that I say that we can conclude that most mixed minority white Americans are in fact becoming part of the mainstream society, expanding it um, and diversifying it. So here are some specific findings. Um, minority white youth start life in more favorable circumstances than do minority only youth. For example, their parents are more highly educated they are more likely to grow up in neighborhoods where they mix with whites as opposed to segregated neighborhoods. On average, um, they achieve better or higher 
educational outcomes than minority only um, Americans do. As adults, they mix with whites, although they also have relationships to non-whites. They have very high rates of marriage to whites, which suggests um, that they are in fact in social environments where many whites are present, because after all, um, you know, we choose partners from the places where we work or the places where we've gone to school or the people we interact with in neighborhoods. Um, and as I said earlier, they have fluid identities, which is an unusual trait, different from whites, different from minorities, and their identities generally include both minority and white elements. Okay, so this, we're in a transition here. So now I'm going to step back for a moment and I'm going to ask the question, so why is this occurring? You know, what's bringing about this increasing contact um, across lines that leads to a lot of mixing in families and the rise of this mixed group of young people who have both white and minority family origins. Um, and the argument I'm going to make is that there is there, there's a demographic dynamic um, that lies behind it. And it has to do with changes between older and younger Americans. So, for example, today in the United States, the people who are leaving the ages of economic and civic leadership um, are people in the baby boom, which was a heavily white group born after World War II between the, eight, between the years 1946 um, and uh, 1964. So today, the baby boomers um, in age range from the mid-70s to the late 50s. So some of them are still working. Some of them are retired. But over the next 10 to 15 years, almost all of them um, will be retired. So as they retire, they open up positions in the, in the labor force, um, in leadership position of organizations. Somebody has to replace them. Well, um, the young people who are coming of age, who are going to be occupying positions in the labor market in the near future, are much more diverse um, than the baby boomers who are retiring. So this gives rise to what I've called non-zero-sum mobility. So upward mobility by minorities can occur because so many whites are retiring and there are not enough qualified whites to replace them. So it means that upward mobility occurs without downward mobility by a previously dominant group having to occur. And by the way, um, there's a paper I'd like to think it's famous, maybe not yet, but by myself and Guillermo Rizar Barbosa, um, which we published in Ethnic and Racial Studies in 2016, which gives lays out the empirical case um, that this is happening. So I wanna just review, what is that empirical case? So, okay, so first of all, the demographic part. So this is what demographers call a population pyramid. It's a way of displaying the age and sex structure of a population. This is for the United States in the year 2019. And there's color coding to indicate the ethno-racial backgrounds of the people in the population pyramid. So if we take any bar like Look at the bar 55 to 59. That's the an age group. Let, let me use my pointer here. Can I do that? Yes. Okay. So here it is. 55 to. Oops. Sorry. Didn't mean to do that. Uh, back. Uh oh. I can't go back. Oh. Yeah. Oh there. Okay. Whew. Okay. 55 to 59. So um, so this is the tail end of the baby boom, and. The width of the bar, the total width of the bar, indicates the number of people in that age group today. The color coding indicates the ethno-racial composition of that age group. So the red portions of the bars 
are for whites, the green portions are for, for minorities, and the, the smaller white portions are the mixed uh, minority um, white individuals. Now, notice as you look from older to age to younger bars, you see that um, after the baby boom, the red bars grow noticeably smaller. So there are fewer whites in younger age groups than there were in the baby boom. And the green bars, the green portions of the bars grow larger. There are more minorities um, than uh, in the younger age groups than there are in older ones. But also the white parts, they still may look small, but not that small because in the bottom, they're about 10%. Um, so those are the mixed individuals. And as we go from, again, from older to younger, the white portions of the bars grow, grow larger. So as the baby boom leaves, uh, the ages of economic activity, there have to be non-whites who replace some of the, the baby boomers because there are not enough whites. And we can see that when we look at um, the top tier of the labor force. So that's what this chart does. So what it shows in a nutshell is that among the older age groups in an earlier period, whites were totally dominant in the top tier. So for example, look at the, you can see in the upper left hand corner, the figure 85.8. So that is the percentage of people in the, in a top tier of the labor force um, in 2000 who were older, who were born in the years 1935 to 44. So in other words, 85%, 86% of this top tier, I'm calling it the top quartile. Um, it's basically the best quarter of jobs as you can think of it that way. So 86% of those jobs were held in the year 2000 by whites for among for old, the older age group. As we go from um, older to younger, we're looking at how um, over time, the recruitment into this top tier is changing. And you can see that in 2000, um, as we go from older to younger, um, it's going from 86% to 73%. Okay, now we step down in time, we go forward in time to 2015-19. That, that gives you the data actually. Not um, So now, um, again, we go from older to younger and we see again that, that things are changing, that the youngest people who are entering um, the top tier um, in 2015-19 to 19 are much less white. Um, that whites represent only 62% as opposed to 86%. So there's a process here of replacement over time that um, is really making the top of the American workforce much more diverse, um, much less dominated by whites. Um, so there are many more minorities and there are more people of mixed backgrounds. So if we look at this another way, we can see sort of who it is um, that's gaining the most from these changes. So instead of looking at the composition of the top tier, this looks at the probability that a person from a particular background will get into that top tier. And again, um, it does it by birth cohort. <laughs> but you can see that um, there aren't many changes across birth cohorts here. It's not that the lines are straight, but that they're not far from being straight. The real difference is in the, is, is as we look vertically, sort of it's from one group to another. So this is a an ethno-racially stratified situation. What group you come from is strongly associated with your likelihood of getting a really good job, a job in the top quarter of the of the workforce. So what do these probabilities show? Well, first of all, they show that actually the top probability is not for whites. It's for Asians. They are the purple line here. 
unmixed Asians are the most likely to get a job in the top quartile. The next group is a mixed group. It's the mixed Asian white group. Then in with the red line tells us about unmixed whites. Um, what is their probability of getting a job in the top quartile? And notice that there's a line that's very close to theirs. That's for another mixed group. It's for the, that's the tan line. And it's for the group that is mixed Latino and mixed non-Latino white. Finally, we go down, well, the other group is actually pe mainly people with complex mixed backgrounds. Then comes individuals who are black and white. And finally, at the very bottom, the bottom four lines are all associated with, um, with, and I'm sorry, the bottom three lines are all associated with unmixed um, minority groups, unmixed Hispanic, unmixed Black, unmixed Native American. So um, as the population becomes more diverse, people are filtering into the top quartile according um, to these to these probabilities. And these probabilities show that apart from Asians, the mixed groups that, that involve a white parent and a non-white parent have higher probabilities of entering the top quartile than do the unmixed minorities. Okay, um, well, I, I said, and I wanna just show you that mixed individuals also have very high probabilities of marriage to whites. Um, and so that says something about where they fit in American society, who they interact with, um, and who then they are likely to choose as a as a partner. So um, you can see that among men, the probability that a mixed per these are these these are all mixed categories. American Indian white, Asian white, black white, Hispanic Anglo, um, and you can see that in every case, the probability for men of, that such a person will marry a white partner is about 60%. And the, the probability that they'll marry someone from the same minority background is much, much less. And the storyline is really basically the same for women, except that um, women who are partly black and partly white have a noticeably lower probability of marrying a white person than the other mixed members of the other mixed categories do. But notice that even there, their probability, 48%, is higher than their probability, twice, at least twice as high as their probability of marrying um, a, an, an exclusively black person. So this pattern of high intermarriage with whites shows that indeed that there really is a kind of mixing with whites in the mainstream society, and this gives rise to these very high uh, marriage probabilities. Okay, so now let me try to tie this in with a, with an assimilation history and to say that we can gain a lot of insight into what's going on by considering how assimilation worked in the past. And in 1950, American society, its mainstream, was not an exclusively white mainstream or not an, a, a broad white mainstream. It was a white Christian mainstream. That is to say that white Protestants were the dominant group in American society and white Catholics and Jews were really on the margins of, of the mainstream and not really um, integrated into it, not really seen as fit, for example, for leadership positions in American society. That changed very dramatically in the 25 years following World War II. Um, so in those 25 years, um, Catholics and Jews clearly became in, in very large numbers a part of uh, the mainstream um, society. And indeed, the identity of the mainstream society changed. It went from being white Christian to white Judeo-Christian. I mean, when, when whites talked about it in those days, they didn't say white Judeo-Christian, they said we're Judeo-Christian 
society, meaning that Jews and Catholics are now really um, welcome in the mainstream. So notice then that to assimilate, Catholics and Jews did not have to change their religions. They still stayed Catholics and Jews and even asserted um, ethnic identities that had been frowned upon before. Um, so in the 1970s, there was a period often understood, I think incorrectly, as a period of ethnic revival in which these identities like Italian American, Irish American, Jewish American became um, very prominent. So, and this was a period of assimilation, but assimilation didn't mean kind of losing one's background, but it did mean becoming a part of the mainstream. During this period of assimilation, intermarriage, first between people of different ethnic backgrounds uh, within the same religion, and then between people of different religions soared among whites. And today in American society, the great majority of whites come from mixed um, ethnic backgrounds. As the mainstream expanded in the post-World War II period and became more diverse, this was evident in the mainstream culture, as was reflected in television, movies, novels, during the post-World War II period. So for example, on television, which became um, the dominant medium in the 1950s, um, the popular shows, many of them, were associated with this ethnic diversity. So um, the, the television comedian who was most popular was named Milton Berle and had grown up as a second generation Eastern European Jew on the Lower East Side. Um, the, the singer who was most popular was Perry Como, who came from um, an uh, Italian-American background. And, the, and another comedian who was very popular was Jackie Gleason, who came from an Irish background. And in all cases, their comedy or their, their, their music reflected to some extent um, their, their ethnic identity so that truly the culture became more diverse. Okay, let me now wrap up. So um, one thing I believe is that American society needs a new narrative about the impact of uh, immigration on it and its future as a result of large scale um, immigration. So the current narrative of the majority minority society is I argue inaccurate but it's also very divisive because we know toward conservative politics and a support for candidates like, like Donald Trump. And I mean, it may well be that some point in the future, whites will be outnumbered by people of color, though not nearly as quickly as the Census Bureau projects, but in any event, I, I would argue that that society where there's a great deal of mixing will not look like we currently imagine it. It will not be a society that is divided into two parts, one white and one minority. It will have a large group in the middle of people who are um, in some sense involved in both of these worlds. So I, I think it's a fair conclusion that um, the evidence points to, again, expansion of the mainstream, greater diversity now bringing into the mainstream groups that come from outside of, of Europe. In arguing for assimilation, though, I don't mean to argue that we have somehow overcome racism because racism is still very important in, in American society. So we are paradoxically a society where both this racism and assimilation are powerful forces shaping our present and shaping our future. But finally, I want to say, I think it's wrong to argue that demography is destiny when it comes to race um, and ethnicity. These are not characteristics of individuals that are somehow ingrained in a way that makes them immutable to social forces. 
So in that respect, our demographic future is indeterminate. It cannot, will not be determined solely by the standard demographic forces, fertility, mortality, migration. The key to understanding that future lies in the social locations of upwardly mobile Americans who have some minority background. And this is going to be determined by the willingness, really, of Americans of, of various origins to interact across boundaries and to accept one another. That's a sociological force, not a demographic force. And then I'll end there. Thank you. I'm done. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard, for this very interesting and, and, and great talk. So I'm gonna I'm gonna be sort of a moderator now to have some uh, comments, questions, and answers. Great. Uh, okay. So if, if you don't mind, I think we're gonna we're gonna start by looking at um, maybe maybe in Seattle, Audrey, uh, if if someone can raise their hands or if you can let me know uh, if someone wants to participate, you can write something on the chat or the students here in Puebla, they can also raise their hand in the in the in the platform. And maybe before that, I want to say, Richard, that we are we are very grateful and we appreciate a lot what you share because uh, I, I didn't mention this before and Elena uh, maybe just briefly did. This is uh, an effort between Universidad Iberoamericana Puebla and Seattle University to have something called um, Collaborative Online International Learning. So starting next week, our students here in Mexico and the students in the US are gonna, are gonna be having what you, what you just said, like we're gonna be interacting across different boundaries to know more about the challenges that we are experiencing in our own uh, societies, societies, right? And uh, but, anyways, uh, Audrey, well, that's, you well, that's wonderful. I, I think that's really great for, for students in both locations. I know yeah. Americans, American students can really benefit from having a deeper understanding of what it's like to live in another society. And in a way, I, I have the impression, and I feel that the students in Seattle are maybe more aware of a lot of the of the terms of the discussion that you just posed. I mean, the idea of mainstream, for instance, I think is is harder to to get in in in, in, in Latin American countries or in Mexico at least. But but there are some references to that. I mean, for example, if we talk about religion, our mainstream in terms of religion was mainly Catholic. Yes. But over the last 20, 30 to 40 years, we have been uh, having some changes in relation to religion and, and you know Mexico is not a traditional a large immigration country but we are you know we are changing and more and more people from mainly from Central America but from other places in Latin America and other places in the world are considering in staying due to different forces and in many cases due to political um, decisions and, and migration policies connected to, to the U.S. So if there are no questions, I think I'm going to start with some questions, some reactions, Richard, that I have. Um, I would like to ask you about if you are thinking um, in, in this analysis of the of the of the mix, uh, mixing origins and the mix people with minority mixing and, and what you just described, what's the role of of cities, what's the role of geography, like what, what can you tell, are you planning in looking at that in, in some way, because I... Well, well I'm not, but geography is clearly very important, and, um, you know, it's, it's very clear that from studies of this mixing, that the more diverse places in the U.S. are the places where it's occurring, because that's where there's much greater probability that people can meet as equals across these the, this ethno these ethno racial boundaries, um, so and 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 places that are less diverse, you know, in some parts of the United States, um, are really in, almost entirely white, and so obviously then it's it's extremely difficult for um, an individual living there to meet someone 
um, from a different kind of ethno-racial background. If I, I, I'm off, I often live in Brooklyn. Um, I don't live only in Brooklyn, but I often live here. And, um, you know, those of you in Seattle know that Brooklyn is part of New York City and in, Me in Pre Puebla, I hope you know that. But in any event, if I go for a walk in the park, and there's a, a wonderful park right near my house, um, but very much like Central Park, actually, designed by the same designer, Frederick Hall Olmsted. Um, if I go for a walk on a Sunday morning in uh, in Prospect Park and I see the couples that, you know, have been together on a Saturday night, um, it's astonishing how many of them are mixed. You know, it's just very, very striking and very different from what I would have encountered almost anywhere in the United States 20 years ago. And so I think it really speaks to, um, a, you know, a greater freedom that people have uh, to to mix with people from other ethno-racial groups. Um, and so this pattern that I'm describing is really not at all receding. If anything, it's really growing uh, over time. I have two more questions, and then we're going to listen to to Elena. And she raised her hand. So the, the the quick question, Richard, is: You mentioned that the U.S. Census Bureau made the decision to allow multiple race reports, but can you tell us more about how or when that happened? Because I'm not really sure. aware. Okay. Of so so um, so the U.S. Census Bureau, prior in the 20th century, had had fit everyone into single categories, regardless of how mixed they might be. So, you know, if you were either white or black or Hispanic, but, but mixing was not acknowledged in the census. Um, as um, more couples began to have mixed children, the parents began to agitate for a way to reflect the mixing of their children on the census. So it was kind of from the ground came this movement to add um, the possibility of mixture to the census. So in 20, uh, in 2000, or, or I should say for the census of 2000, the Census Bureau um, decided to allow people to choose more than one race. So they could say, oh, I'm black and I'm white, or I'm Asian and I'm, I'm uh, American Indian. Um, but what they did not allow, and this was an enormous oversight that really plagues our data and really distorts our data, what they did not allow was for people to say they were part Hispanic and part not Hispanic. So we're still stuck with census data that don't show the profound extent of mixing. Um, and that's been this has been going on for a long time. So you know, when I looked in my book, The Great Demographic Illusion, um, at infants and who their parents were, going back in the census um, to 1980, which was as far back as I could go, there was a lot of mixing <coughs> then between Hispanics and non-Hispanic white Americans. And that continues. So today in the US, one of every five babies born who has a Hispanic parent, has a non-Hispanic white parent. In fact, one of every four Hispanic babies has a non-Hispanic parent. So Hispanics are very consequential for this mixing. Great, thank you. And, and, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna keep my other questions maybe for later. I'm gonna first listen to Elena. Let's listen to Elena and then maybe in Seattle we have another question. So please go ahead, Elena. Well, thank you very much, uh, Richard, for this presentation. And um, I know that your focus must, is more sociological and demography, of course. And you mentioned just briefly about the Trump administration. I would, uh, I would like to hear your thoughts about in the Trump, or if you can go deeper, what are your thoughts about the Trump administration and the assimilation, and later, with Biden, especially, I think Kamala Harris, for instance, is is like a very important reference for this topic, right? And also um, another issue, it's about, well, it was very interesting for me to to view the differences 
the politics of, of gender going here in this demography and how for for instance, for white women, it's um, less. It's a lower the percentage to get in, mar in to get married with a white man, and it's the country for for uh, black men, right? So there's also here uh, um, we can study this from a gender perspective, and so no, my right, start. we can. Yeah, that's a really good point, and I okay. think it's true that. Um, in general, well, it's true certainly for blacks and for Latinos that um, that men have a greater ability to transcend these boundaries and to choose non non coethnic partners than than women do. And, and, you know, this pattern among among African-Americans of men being much more likely to have white partners than women are to have white partners has been has existed for a very long time. And so there are there are articles that go back to the 1940s, believe it or not, that describe this gender difference in in out marriage for African Americans. And there are various theories about why it, it exists. Um, yeah. And your other question, wait, you had two. I'm sorry, I got so involved I forgot. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Because uh, I, I put the two questions together. It was your thoughts about, well, Trump oh, about the Trump administration, and especially now the Biden administration and Kamala Harris, for it, because like it would be an example. Of, uh, yes, 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 yes. OK, well, um, first of all, I think that these processes that we're talking about that bring together um, people in these couples are they're really on the ground processes. It's, you know, this is about people who are proximate to one another. Um, and it's not about uh, very much about national policy or national politics. I don't think that that really has much of an impact. Um, the one thing, though, that might have an impact is that under Trump, the um, immigration was very much reduced. And so, um, and indeed, you, you may know that, you know, that the um, immigration of the last 10 years is lower than immigration has, was in the preceding decades. And that's particularly because of the very low immigration of the Trump years. If this pattern continues, I mean, if, for example, Trump or someone like Trump were to be elected president again and to, uh, and to shut down immigration, I think that will have an impact on the, I think it will actually um, accelerate the ongoing assimilation. So closing the gates on immigration in the 1920s, which is the previous era when immigration was shut down, accelerated assimilation because it deprived ethnic communities of newly of, of, of sort of new inflows of members. And so over time, um, you know, as more people moved out, um, which is inevitable for younger people, the communities themselves shrank and became, uh, you might say, more, more uh, stagnant. You know, they, they didn't have the same kind of cultural vitality um, that they had had during the era of immigration. So, um, but, you know, I think that Trump definitely kind of had a harsh rhetoric directed against minorities in general. And, um, you know, and this has been sort of taken over really by the Republican Party that um, in many ways has parroted um, Trump's line. And so this has created in politically a big divide between um, the whites who've become adherents of the Republican Party, I mean, the majority of whites today vote for Republicans, and then the many minorities who, uh, who especially those who have any kind of progressive um, tendency, who, you know, affiliate with the Democratic Party. So there's a real ethno-racial divide um, in American politics <coughs> that was promoted by Trump. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Elena. Uh, Audrey or someone over there in, in Seattle, um, would you like to say something? Yeah. 
Yes, we're we're we've got some questions brewing, and one of them is um, how does socioeconomic background or socioeconomic class affect the probability of interracial marriage? Is that something that you've you've looked at? That's a really good question, and um, I can't say that I've looked at it in any detail, um, but I think on the whole, the higher the socioeconomic background of an individual, the family background, the more likely that person is to is to intermarry. And where this pattern incidentally is strongest is among Latinos. And among Latino women, there's a very strong correlation between education level and and intermarriage. And I think this is partly because um, when young people grow up in the United States, they often grow up in very segregated communities. I mean, that's true of whites, too, that they grew up in communities that are very heavily white for the most part. And so when do they really get a chance to meet other young people on a you know, in, in kind of equal social relations who are different in college because they go to schools and elementary schools and even high schools that are not as diverse as the schools <coughs> as 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 our colleges. So it's it's when people get, are getting more education that they tend then to encounter more diverse people who are are really equal to them who can you know kind of interact with them on a, on a, on an equal basis Agree? Uh, thank, thank you very much we, we we just have one follow-up question you you spoke very well to the idea of um how politicians like trump have disrupted the the rate the rates of assimilation um and so I think building on that, what what impact do you think that this uh, white fear or concerns about uh, that are expressed by the white population? What what effect do you think that will have on our electoral processes and our politics moving forward? Well, I I, I would put it this way that um, <clears throat> that we are a very divided country now politically. Um, Maybe more div divided than at any time since the uh, since the Vietnam War, and I think that our politics in the Vietnam War it was still the case that Democrats were very much um, the dominant party uh, in terms of government, and so they were still able. I mean, a lot of um, important policies were instituted during the 1960s when the Vietnam War gradually, you know, the period when the Vietnam War became this overwhelming issue and um, it, the civil rights laws, Medicare, um, you know, many, many important changes. But today, I think we find um, that because of the, we are really divided politically in a way that the parties are, are if not equal, not far from it. Um, and so um, we have governments that really are not very effective. They're not really able to in, to bring about policies of change. I mean, that's very clear with the current Democratic administration, which certainly began um, its period in office with great ambitions um, to bring about a positive change, but found that its margins in the Congress were so narrow that it really could do very little. And in fact, in the Senate, as we know, it's, it's a 50-50 division. And one senator, because he's more conservative than other Democratic senators, namely Senator Joe Manchin from West Virginia, has become the linchpin of all votes in the Senate. What he decides is the way the vote is going to go. I mean, that's not an effective way for any political party to govern. And I, I because the, the Republicans have been so effective at driving many whites um, away from the Democratic Party out of fear of racial change, I, I really worry that we're going to remain in this kind of stalemated position for quite some time. Thank you. 
Great. So we have a we have a question from a Mexican student from uh, Max Maximiliano Perez. Uh, he he wrote in the chat, but I don't think you can you, you cannot read it, right? I, I don't think I can see the chat. Okay, so you can so read it to me. I'm gonna read it. It says, "Good afternoon." Good afternoon, Professor Alba. I have a question regarding the role of economic inequality yes. on, on the United States and a possible relation with the assimilation process on the society um, in this country. Uh, could this economic phenomenon, I, I, I'm assuming the economic inequality, push the wealthiest uh, ethno, uh, ethno-racial groups could, could to only link with the same economic. Oh, okay. So he's saying that if the economic inequality um, can if prove it, if it, that only that only whites are connected with whites and not with others. Yeah. Uh, okay. That's a good, very good question. So um, let me say first of all that in terms of economic inequality, that there's a big contrast between the earlier period of assimilation and the current period of assimilation. So in the earlier period of assimilation in the post-World War II period, first it was a time of great prosperity in American society because American society had emerged relatively unscathed from the war. And many other wealthy countries like the countries of Europe had been badly damaged um, by the war. It sort of took them a lot of time <coughs> to recover. So economic inequality was quite low um, in American society. And the expansion of opportunity, for example, uh, the growth, the expansion of college education was quite high. So these were, these were conditions that were very favorable to assimilation. And in general, I think, you know, economic inequality, as you're suggesting, um, is a hindrance to assimilation. And so we know um, there's a lot of research that shows that social mobility in the United States is relatively low, relatively low in historical terms and relatively low when the United States is compared to other countries. So this has to impact assimilation. So the assimilation that I'm showing is in spite of um, this economic inequality. Nevertheless, you know, um, the dominant group remains whites and whites are, yes, they include, um, you know, a very affluent, a very wealthy segment, but they also include a very large middle. And in fact, a, a lot, there are a lot of working class whites. Um, so in that sense, you know, I, I, I don't think that we can describe the situation in the United States as one in which whites are wealthy and therefore are not going to associate with rising non-whites because the number of wealthy whites is actually relatively small. So, you know, I don't think that in and of itself, the force you describe in and of itself will be a bar to, to additional mixing across you know the ethno-racial boundary great thank you richard thank you max for the question yes thank um, you very much anyone else in seattle or, or here in puebla we also have some students actually uh, connected uh, for, uh, in oaxaca and other places closer to to puebla in the south but anyone else have a question or i think we should get closer to the last part of this wonderful presentation by Richard. By, by Richard, Richard, I, I have a, I have a, a question for you and or like a, a reaction to, to the, to what you shared the, towards the end of your presentation, because you said that in the US, um, there is a need for a new narrative in American society. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm wondering, like, have you thought about what, can you make an invitation to, to students in the US or to What's the role of universities, universities in, in other places like here in Mexico, to, to think about how to contribute? Because, I mean, when you said that there is a need for a new narrative, I'm wondering, like, who developed that narrative? Uh, like, That's a really I mean, good question. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there yeah, are yeah, different, yeah. different actors, different areas, but what <laughs> yes. would you say to students, to universities, or 
What's your well, okay, so so I, I have to say that I, I, I see myself among sociologists at least as more and more um, unusual in emphasizing the, that what, what universities should do is create knowledge. And I think that is what universities can uniquely give to their societies. And, you know, you, you hear, that's what I at least am trying to do. Of course, the creation of, I mean, we, each of us can think we're creating knowledge and it's up to a larger scientific community to decide if this is really knowledge or not. You know, does it really meet the test required for knowledge? But I, but I think the university sector has the unique role of creating knowledge and also integrating um, that knowledge about things that are happening in the contemporary society with its knowledge about the past. So, you know, so that the universities are also a repository of historical knowledge. And so I, I think that the university intellectuals often seated at the universities do have a role for constructing new ideas about how a society is changing, a new narrative to help us understand better um, kind of where a society is headed. And, you know, I think there's evidence now to show that a narrative that um, says what's happening in America today in terms of the mixing across ethno-racial lines is rather similar to what has happened in America in the past is a much less alarming narrative then a narrative says that this is a society divided between whites and non-whites, and the non-whites are gaining and the whites are losing. That has contributed, in my opinion, contributed, you know, measurably to the kind of political stalemate that we currently face. Great. Thank you, Richard. We have another question from a student, actually. This is uh, Natalia Ricardes. She, I, I assume she's connected in Oaxaca. Natalia, would you like to turn on your, your microphone and uh, ask the question? Yes, well, yeah, yeah, of course. Well, Please go ahead, actually, yeah. Well, hi. I don't know Talia. if you can see me. Hi. Yes, I can see you now. Nice to see uh, you. Nice to see you. And thank you so much again, Richard, for the amazing presentation. I have a question related to the current narrative that you were talking before, uh, related to race, color, and skin characteristics. Yes. Do you think that in the future, these factors will no longer be taken into account or maybe will not longer be seen as they do now in order to interact in society or maybe Will not I think be that like... they're already becoming less important. Okay. And uh, so, you know, and uh, I think it was Elena, perhaps, who asked me to, to uh, talk about Kamala Harris. And I would say not just Kamala Harris, but Barack Obama. Um, you know, when Barack Obama was elected president <laughs> in 2008, I think that most educated Americans had they been asked 10 years before then, will a black person be elected president would have said, are you kidding? That's not gonna happen. Um, and um, and I, I think there's also some, an interesting kind of similarity between Harris and Obama, which tells us something about kind of how the society is changing. They're the children of immigrants. They are not, I mean, we're, what Barack Obama, though he's clearly black, we're not talking about an African-American whose family was oppressed by slavery, oppressed by Jim Crow afterwards, you know, has, has been kind of suffered from racism for centuries. We're talking about somebody who's the child of an immigrant and who had a white parent. Um, and, and Kamala Harris, though she's not, um, doesn't have a white parent, she has parents from two different major ethnic racial groups. So, so both immigration and mixing are important. And, and to some extent, they are diffusing, you know, the, the impact of, of, of skin color on the way people are received. And of course, with Obama, you know, I think 
One thing that's important to recognize is that he was raised by his white mother and his white great grandparents. And he mixed with many whites in Hawaii as when he was a younger person. And he was able to address, because he, he was comfortable with whites, having grown up with them, that's the key. Not, you didn't grow up in a segregated community the way, unfortunately, you know, many minorities today grew up. He grew up in a much more integrated circumstance. He was better able to address whites as an audience, as a political audience. He knew kind of how they think. He knew how to talk to them in a way that somebody who had grown up in a much more segregated background would not. So I think this is the key, you know, is is kind of having young people mix across these lines as people from mixed family backgrounds do. They mix with whites, they mix with members of the minority side of their family. Um, so they have an, an under, a bicultural understanding that's not true of more segregated Americans. Did your question. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you, Richard. Thank you so much. Oh, it's a nice, very, very good question. Thank you for asking it. Uh, Elena or Audrey or anyone else in, in, in the audience online or over there in Seattle would like to say something else. I think we should um, wrap up and go. Uh, no, no one. Uh, Richard, I'm, I'm truly grateful and thankful for, for you. Uh, being here with us and sharing all this, all this knowledge, all this uh, work, all this stuff. I mean, you know, you're someone that I really admire. I'm, I'm very thankful for you being a, 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 a teacher, a professor, a mentor for me. And I'm very thankful for that. And um, would you like to say something else? Would you like to, to maybe yes, give some, I, some I, advice? You know, I'm very, to, I'm to very grateful students. for the conversation. And um, I always appreciate questions that you know, that helped me to think about issues that I may not have given enough attention to. But, you know, I hope um, that the American students will believe, I mean, this is an awful time, I think, in the United States, a time when uh, that I never thought would come. When, when I was growing up, no one ever imagined that the democratic structures of, of American society would come into question. So, you know, I hope that young people can still believe in the idea of, of the United States and, um, and you know, work to support those, demogra those democratic structures against the forces that would um, eviscerate them and make us into a different, a different kind of country. And, and I hope very much, Guillermo um, and Elena, to see you sometime in Puebla. I mean, you know, I, I, I like, I really, have always loved my visits to Oaxaca and the Yucatan and other parts of Mexico, and I hope to come again. You are more than welcome to come anytime, Richard. Please, please do it. Let's. Uh, we will wait for you with, with food and good weather for sure. <laughs> and Audrey says, on behalf of the students from Seattle University, thank you. This was so interesting and sets an important tone for our consideration of migration this quarter. Um, any, any invitation to the Mexican students, Richard, to the, to, the, to the Mexican university that would like, you know, to connect with stuff that is going on beyond our borders? Well, I think it's a wonderful, I think it's wonderful that you're doing that. Of course, I'm now retired, so I'm hardly in a position to, to create such connections, but um, I think they're very important. And I've learned a lot from living in other countries. I mean, as you know, I've lived in, in Germany and France and um, I think it's really important to see to see how another society works. So, Great. Okay. Gracias, Richard. Un, un Thank you abrazo. very much. Gracias. Gracias a todos. <laughs> Thank you very much, Richard, for being here. Thank you very much also to to Seattle University. We're looking forward to have the COIL course and um, hope to see you in person soon, Richard. And I hope so. Seattle. Okay. Also, we hope to have this experience in presence for a, maybe one or two weeks in, in one year. Okay, great. Okay, bye everybody.